Okay, so good afternoon and good evening all, and a very warm welcome on behalf of the uh, IABB events team. We are very much looking forward to supporting you with today's UN Friends of Vision 2022 High Level Political Forum. If you struggle to see, you struggle to learn, accelerating progress towards the SDGs through school eye health programmes. I'm now delighted to hand over to Oli Barrett to welcome you to the webinar after this very short video. Thank you very much. Well, hello and a very warm welcome indeed to this extra special gathering. I don't know if I've ever known so many hashtags for one event. That gives you every clue you need that this is the place to be. And on a serious note, wherever you're tuned in from around the world, you're very welcome indeed. If you're watching live, if you're watching on Catch Up, welcome to this gathering. I'm Ollie Barrett and it's my honour to be your co-host. Um, this is a subject incredibly close to my heart. I was out in Dubai with the remarkable gathering under the auspices of the IAPB just a few months ago, and everything that was said resonated uh, with me, and I know will with you, because we're making the link between education and schools and eye health and learning. Um, first of all, um, let's just set uh, the scene a little bit. Uh, this is, as you know, a UN Friends of Vision uh, official side event at the 2022 High Level Political Forum. Um, its whole point is accelerating progress towards the SDGs through the school eye health programmes. Why? Because, put bluntly, if you struggle to see, you struggle to learn. Um, so the High Level Political Forum, as you know, is the preeminent UN platform on sustainable development, and it plays a really central role in the follow-up and review at the global level of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals. So that's what we're moving towards. And uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how that's happening, because this year, as you know, under the overarching theme of building back better from the coronavirus, um, the, H, uh, the HLPF is conducting a thematic review of social development, uh, development goal, a sustainable development goal four on quality education. So the idea is that this event brings together um, UN diplomats and agencies, experts in public health, economics and technology, students and teachers, really to discuss how vision can contribute <clears throat> to progress on SDG4, recovery from COVID, and particularly to accelerate progress on that 2030 agenda. Um, why does this matter? Well, eye health is a universal health issue. Uh, nearly all humans will experience in their lifetime. Uh, for many, it will start in, hum uh, in childhood, where vision, of course, plays just this incredibly vital role in development. We'll hear lots about that today. And the bottom line is that without inclusive and equitable education, children are at real risk of being left behind. Over the last two years, we have seen how a major public health crisis can severely restrict children's access to education. And all of those school disruptions have really just increased calls to utilize schools as a resource for influencing the health and well-being of students and their communities. So we'll hear messages on that and we'll talk about how the best programs in the world make that happen because it's absolutely vital that children's eye health gets included in these transformative health promoting programs. We mustn't leave eye health out of a conversation about education. The impact of vision impairment starts with the individual, but it quickly becomes a cross-cutting human development issue. That of course, <laughs> as we'll hear from guests at the World Bank, at the World Health Organization, is a major contributor to global socioeconomic inequalities, as well as outcomes. So that's our theme, because that SDG 4 can't be achieved without addressing eye health. That's our main point today. But let's be honest, there has been limited progress in implementing national health, uh, national eye health policies. 
and indeed in obtaining greater recognition across the sustainable development agenda. So one thing I'll be asking our panel in this hour is how do we move from commitment to action? And the point is this, now is the time to mobilize around the impact that eye health has on the lives of children, their families and communities. So here we are gathered today, we are delighted and indeed honored to be hosted by the UN Friends of Vision Group under the chairmanship of some very recognizable names to you indeed. I'm talking about individuals, including Ambassador Walton Webson, permanent representative of the mission of Antigua and Barbuda, who's in our audience. Ambassador Monwa Hussein, deputy permanent representative of the mission of Bangladesh, some extraordinary programs taking place in that country. Also, Ambassador Brian Flynn, who joins our group and gathering here today, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Mission of Ireland. So a thank you. We're honoured by the support of the Friends of Vision Secretariat, as well as our esteemed guest speakers, each and every one of them, for lending their expertise to this important discussion. And I want to say a personal thank you to the IAPB, the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness, for putting on this event today. So that gives you the background, the why we're here. Let's hear from one of the whole planet's biggest champions of this subject. He needs very little introduction. He's the permanent representative of Antigua and Barbuda to the United Nations. He's the founding co-chair of the UN Friends of Vision Group. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to your screens His Excellency Ambassador Walton Webson. Ambassador Webson, can you uh, are you are you with us? Indeed, I am. And can you hear me? Because my computer seems to be showing some instability in my network. So, are you hearing me well? You are loud and clear, sir. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to your words of welcome. Thank you so much, and thanks to all of the members of the audience who are joining us today. Um, the Friends of Vision is extremely pleased to be working with our colleagues in civil society, the IAPB and others to bring this event to you. And we are particularly pleased with the turnout of representatives from missions and from the general community, general global public, because we're competing in this very day of the HLPF with more than 20 side events at this very time the 115 slots. And we are extremely pleased that we are still able to show the commitment of the community and the member states to be here. I want to thank my esteemed co-chairs from Bangladesh and Ireland um, for we are developing a very strong voice for vision at the United Nations political processes amongst member states. I want to acknowledge deep appreciation to the two ambassadors who co-chaired this friends with me for a number of years who have just, and I mean just moved on, Ambassador Geraldine Bernice of, of Ireland and Ambassador Robert Patton of Bangladesh for their sterling support to me as their co-chair and, um, and their work that they have done. Both have just, this very month, very month um, moved on to, uh, to uh, other assignments within their government and their career development. My friends, first of all, let me point out a couple of facts. Healthy vision or eye health was for the first time included in the outcome document of the high level meeting on universal health. That's, it was in 2019, a major accomplishment as we began to advocate for this international health challenge to be seen as one of the major health challenges we are facing. Just last week, the connection between road safety and vision was included in the political declaration of the high level meeting on, on I'm improving global road safety. Another plea that we had been calling for for many years. 
And of course, you know that last year, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the first United Nations resolution on vision, making, making clear that healthy vision holds the potential to accelerate progress on the 2030 agenda. These are some of the raw facts that we have established in, in a very short period of time in our advocacy. This year, we have an opportunity, colleagues, excellencies, and my friend, friends, to ensure that healthy vision, that eye health can advance education for all. At the heads of government meeting in, the, the, in June, just concluded, the 54 leaders of the Commonwealth nations built on their commitment, which was made in 2018, calling on um, countries, all countries, to make a multi-pronged approach for, ac for access to screening and for and, um, and the creation of affordable treatment, especially for children. You, my friends, do not need to be, to be a teacher or an optometrist to understand that the links between eye health for children and the improvement of education is paramount. The Secretary General of the United Nations is, is hold, holding a transformative um, education summit later this year, in September to be in exact, in order to help focus the world's attention on, um, once again, this is to focus our attention on a once in a generation crisis we are facing in education. COVID-19, as you know, has devastated learning for all worldwide. Transforming education, of course, requires improved approaches to learning, but we must also, be, we must also prioritize the health and, and well-being of the learner. And therefore, we are urging and calling upon all to be sure that I help for all children is included in the education process. Two billion people worldwide have a vision impairment. And of, of that, at least 1.1 billion are living with vision loss because they do not have access to um, basic eye health services. Excellencies, today, 90 million children and adolescents are currently living with sight loss. 80% of, of, of what young children learn is done so but through the process through sights. Uncorrected vision, unaddressed sight and vision health loss is going to create poor learning opportunities and create a struggle for children to learn. But the good news is 90% of all vision loss is avoidable. It is avoidable. And therefore we cannot stand here and make announcements and pronouncements on vision. We must be committed to address unavoidable vision loss. Proven and cost-effective solutions are with us and we must put these into play. This is why healthy vision must be included across the sustainable development goal and it, the entire 2030 agenda and policies uh, must be committed beyond the United Nations to make sure that we can address this. My friends, colleagues, excellencies, let's be sure that healthy vision, I health plays its part in achieving the SDGs and the Transforming Education Summit upcoming. I thank you. Well, a uh, huge thanks to Ambassador Webson 
uh, for his extraordinary championing of this cause uh, for many years now. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our next guest uh, to our screens, uh, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations and also the co-chair of the UN Friends of Vision Group. A very warm welcome to Ambassador Monwa Hossein. Uh, Ambassador Hossein, uh, are you with us? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Co-chairs, excellencies, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for joining the Friends of Vision for this very important event. Vision impairment is a universal challenge that most people will experience in their lifetime. However, avoidable vision impairment or blindness can be both a cause and a consequence of entrenched inequalities. According to a recent estimate, there are 312 million children around the world affected by myopia. And this is set to increase to 324 million by 2025. The burden of blindness disproportionately affects low and middle income countries, where the prevalence of blindness in children is approximately 10 times greater. In Sub-Saharan Africa, almost half of all blindness and low vision in children are due to preventable or treatable causes. Ladies and gentlemen, education has the potential to change individuals' life and fuel uh, social transformation. There is a strong link between children's visual health and the quality of their learning and achievement at schools. Children with vision impairment have poorer educational outcomes and are more likely to be excluded from schools as they are less likely to attend. Children with vision loss are two to five times less likely to be in the formal education in low and middle income countries. The Lancet Commission report found evidence that providing spectacles to children improves educational performance. Additionally, vision disorders of childhood may continue to affect health and well being throughout the adult years. The United Nations resolution on vision makes clear that access to eye care is essential to achieving SDG 4. And we know improved education is crucial to development. Education can also play a catalytic role in re reducing poverty and hunger and enabling work and thus linked to SDGs 1, 2, and 8, respectively. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, vision loss is also a gender issue. Girls and women are 1.3 times more likely to have visual impairment than men. For girls in low and middle income countries, vision becomes a preventable source of inequity that acts as yet another barrier to education. Over the last two years, COVID-19 related schools closure have affected the health and education of all children, but unequally. These severe disruptions have renewed calls to utilize schools as a resource for influencing the health and well-being of students and their communities. Unaddressed vision impairment obstructs a country's ability to eradicate poverty in all its forms, end discrimination and exclusion, and reduce the inequalities. People are needlessly left behind, and it undermines the potential of individual and shared progress. Friends, school eye health programs provide a unique opportunity to deliver comprehensive eye health services to school-going children. Supporting child eye health will lead to a positive impact on learning. It is the key to securing the achievement of inclusive education systems and enhancing our next generation's future quality of life and economic productivity. This will need a whole of society commitment from governments, private sector, communities, families, schools, everyone. Let us join our hands together to promote school high eye health programs. I thank you all. Thank you very much indeed, Your Excellency. Uh, our next guest comes certainly closer to uh, my shores here in the United Kingdom. He is the Deputy Permanent Representative of Ireland to the United Nation, uh, Nations, uh, another co-chair of the Friends of Vision Group. Uh, please welcome to our screens, Ambassador Brian Flynn. Brian, welcome. Thank you, Ali, for that very kind introduction. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, Unfortunately, um, Ambassador Geraldine Bernason couldn't make it today. She's still in New York for another uh, couple of weeks, uh, um, but she couldn't be with us this morning. Um, but um, I think you all know her commitment uh, to this issue, and I'm really delighted to be speaking after my friend Monwar 
and, and of course, Ambassador Webson, and I, I join others in paying tribute to his extraordinary leadership on this issue. Um, so as I say, it's great for me to have the chance to be here um, today. Education is a fundamental human right and the basis for guaranteeing the realization of an adequate standard of living. While there are many barriers to receiving a quality education, vision loss should not be one. Studies show that children are experiencing worsening vision at a faster than expected rate, with almost 4.8 million people worldwide. 50% 50, 50 of the world's population expected to be myopic by 2050. 50% 50 of blindness and low vision in children can be easily prevented or treated, most often with nothing more than a pair of glasses. Glasses are one of the most effective health interventions for children, reducing the odds of failing a class by 44%. But despite this relatively easy solution, there has been limited progress in implementing national child eye health policies. The adoption and implementation of health promoting policies through school-based health interventions can provide the comprehensive eye health care needed by millions of children and support inclusive and equitable education for all. Giving children access to eye care will keep them in school, boost their educational attainment and can strengthen the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It has never been more important to develop initiatives and guidance to implement comprehensive school health programs that engage the education sector in sustainable and transformative efforts to change um, the educational, social, economic and political conditions that affect risk. It is vital that child eye health be included in these programs and global level discussions. School eye health programs can make clear vision a reality for every child, helping millions to achieve their full potential. Elevating the role of vision and acknowledging the impact and rapid growth of vision impairment amongst children will revitalize national and global efforts to achieve STG4. The Friends of Vision calls on member states to ensure the inclusion of eye health in their national commitments at the upcoming Transforming Education Summit and their own national education and development policies. Together, we can strengthen national efforts to implement the UN Resolution on Vision and reimagine education systems for the world of today, but also for the world of tomorrow. Thank you, Ollie. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador Flynn. Uh, now, um, our keynote uh, presentation uh, comes from somebody who, again, is a real world leader. President Masisi is a recognized global champion for school eye health, whose commitment to screen and treat every school child in Botswana provides a, an amazing example of national leadership because it embraces long term social and economic opportunity by delivering clear vision. So to this very special event, it is a great honor to welcome to our screen His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Botswana, Dr. Mogwitsi Masisi, MP. Talents of ceremonies, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to express my deepest appreciation for the kind invitation extended to me to deliver the keynote address at this important forum. Preventing avoidable blindness and vision impairment is crucial for an individual's overall general health and well-being as postulated under goal number three of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Globally, over 90 million children live with vision loss, which inhibits their learning, social participation, and future economic potential. Almost half of this vision loss could have been avoided with something as simple as a pair of glasses. The World Bank report 2019 recommends prioritizing school eye health programs for their utility in delivering a cost-effective model for eye care that targets school-going children. In Botswana, surveys on eye health for children conducted in 2006 revealed a noticeable increase in the number of children with visual impairment and blindness accounting for the third largest prevalence in Africa. These rapid assessment 
of avoidable blindness studies carried out amongst adults aged 50 years and above discover that what accounts for this impairment is the late identification of treatable eye diseases at health facilities, hence childhood blindness. These findings prompted another childhood blindness survey that was conducted in 2019, sorry, 2009, to ascertain the extent of the problem. The results revealed short-sightedness as the leading cause of visual impairment, followed by congen congenital cataract and glaucoma. Apart from identifying the root causes of visual impairment, the studies also indicated the strong linkages between visual health and achievement at school. For example, impaired vision among learners is likely to accentuate learning difficulties, especially in the area of decoding text and following instructions. It has also been established that programs rolled out within the school setting not only serve as a unique opportunity for early detection of eye conditions, but also ensure access to quality eye care. It is also evident that the delivery of comprehensive eye health services reduces the incidence of eye disease and visual impairment in the future. Distinguished guests, nationally and globally, school eye health programs are inadequate to address the issue of visual impairment among school going children. In order to close the existing gaps in Botswana, the ministries of basic education and that of health and wellness collaboratively embarked on a pilot school health, eye health study in Good Hope District in 2016, using peak technology and expertise, courtesy of the partnership between Peak Vision Limited, supported by the Botswana Optometric Association. The study was funded by the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust and Standard Chartered Bank, as well as both ministries, that of health and basic education. During this pilot project, it was revealed that 12,877 children across 49 schools were screened in three weeks. 2,065 were identified with potential eye health problems. 835 children received spectacles and 94 received medication, while 63 were referred for further ophthalmic services. An extension of this program will translate into using the latest eye technology to deliver a comprehensive national school eye health program with primacy given to identifying and treating every school going child with vision problems in the country. We therefore wish to applaud the efforts of Peak Vision that is based in Botswana and the United Kingdom. We would like to extend an invitation to others to also join the program and assist in addressing the inadequacies presented by the challenging landscape we have to cover. This program is called Ponoyami in Setswana, which means my vision. The objective of Ponoyami is to improve the quality of life and educational performance of school going children through eye health promotion, health education, screening assessment, treatment, hence reduction of vision impairment and ocular mobility. Ponoyame also intends to create awareness and sensitization of the project to the parents, to the learners, community leaders, and other stakeholders. The program also increases access to quality eye health care services. It is my earnest belief that Ponoyami, my vision, will definitely give Botswana's children the chance to see clearly and maximize their well-being, education, and productivity. In this regard, we have high expectations that this intervention will have a positive effect of changing individuals' lives and bring about social transformation. Well, a huge thanks to President Masisi and to the Republic of Botswana for your leadership when it comes to eye health and especially for young people. Well, why don't we hear from some of the stakeholders that matter most in all of this. I'm talking, of course, about the children themselves and their families and uh, their communities as well. We're gonna play you uh, a short film which encapsulates this, but why don't I say before you see it that um, we want to acknowledge the work of the Christian Blind Mission, a Friends of Vision Secretariat member, and particularly their Zimbabwe country office, specifically Miss Natasha Mushaya. Thank you, Natasha, for their tremendous work in capturing these vital voices for us to hear today. Let's have a look.
eh dimangua eh bana matuno sangana nawo bane ngi bane ma tambudziko eh like um, eh ai site ne zwimwe zwakadaro eh tandine bana bandi nawo kisha na enjo eh wanga vachitambudzika pa kuona saka of course we we used to lie with the parents tichiwa udza kuti hava nawo vane matambudziko akata kati pabereko vachidini vachi batsirana nevana eh isuti ngo batsira kuti zvite zvakanaka saka with time eh tinofara kuti eh pakazuya ove CBM eh saka vauya vanga vane chirongwa chawo chokuongorora vana maziso eh takataura one maparents eh maparents akaita ho respond vakatsigira chirongwa ichocho eh tikabatsirana navo eh vana vakatestwa eh mushikuru mekutestwa zvishuwa vakawanikwa kuti adabudziko ranga riripo eh isuti kati vaudzawo even CBM kuti ah even sitting arrangement in my classroom hazvazvo sina tombomira zvakanaka eh saka vakazo pindwa muchirongwa chekuti vabatsirwe nema nema glass saka vakapiwa ma glass vakapiwa eh kubva wo ipapo pa vakapiwa ma glass eh you find kuti vakuradza kuti vakuona even taiwo wanza kuvaisa kumberi kuti va kudize ne board kuti vaone zviri pa board pa pa saka izvo zvizvi hava kungogara vari mu classroom mumwe amu vakungogara anywhere eh kana kumberi koko kana pakati kana kumashure eh vachitonyatsa kutoona basa rawo eh asi mushure mokubatsirwa find kuti eh ha even performance yavo eh yakatoimbrufa kubva pana izvozvo eh saka ngo kurudzirawo vamwe varaidzi dzivango eh kuti kana vakaona mwana achitaura zvishuwa kuti eh mwana asi kunyatsa kuona zviri pa board anenge achitori sapati pane dambudziko saka zviri zvaiti kuti munokonza utawo eh vakakodzera vokubatsirayo zvikuru sei ha ava vanonzi CBM havakanyanya vari kumberi eh saka tinotarisira kuti varambi vachita chirongwa ichocho vachibatsira vana eh kuti zvende mberi chaizvo izvo saka no kana taita kuti vamwe vana vane ma challenges eh tinovimba kuti tinoona mbachi vakonza uta eh vachitira zvakanaka vasangoitira Tomlinson chat eh vaiti vezimbabwe yose ne pasiros Your and I'm grade 7B at Tamlison Depot Primary School. I realized that I had an eye problem at grade 4 when I was 8 years old. Uh, I was treated when CBM came to Tamlison Depot School and they tested uh, our class and half of the classes at school and when they tested it they saw that I had a problem and then they gave me some specs. I would like to thank the CBM for um, giving me the opportunity to get my life back and that I could actually get to see the chalkboard clearly. And I'd like to encourage other children out there, don't be shy. It's not a problem to wear spectacles. It's actually unique. I'm the date for Angel. Kondo is in grade 7. Uh, we realized she had an eye problem when she was in grade 4. She could complain that the eyes were itching on a daily basis and being parents we decided to try some eye lotions, hygiene and everything but the itching continued. So sometime this, this year we got a, a message that CBM was coming to assist uh, with medication and some tests on the eyes. We really ran to <laughs> check into the school. Uh, we've seen a huge change and an impact on her because she couldn't see the chalkboard clearly and so it, even at home she couldn't even watch TV, she would sit close to the TV and it was really impacting her in her studies. She's a student we expect to uh, excel in her studies but this side was really having challenges. Finally, when she got specs, we've seen a huge and marked increase in improve, improvement to her sight. We're really grateful from the Christian Blind Mission, CBM, in short, for the assistance. 
the culminated in the opportunity time. Remember, my daughter is in grade seven and she's about to write exams. It will really go a long way in helping. We, it's a program that we really appreciate and we hope it will continue for years to come. I would like parents to encourage their children to go for screening, even at an early age, because it will definitely improve their lives. Um, the stigma around people who use spectacles, a lot has been said, I also suffer from it, but uh, from an early age, you see the children around my daughter, they've some, they've been trying to stigmatize her. But we think that parents and society around should accept that blindness or uh, visual impairment is a challenge that is amongst us and it's amongst us to stay. So getting screened early, getting tested early, and getting corrective repairs like uh, eyeglasses in, the, in our case is the best way to go. But thank you so much for the program once again, and we hope it continues from now and forever. Phenomenal. I think that film should be seen by the government of every country in the world. Thank you very much indeed to our friends at CBM for their help pulling that together. Let's include uh, some others in the discussion. You're tuning in as I speak from all around the world. Greetings to our friend in Ivory Coast who has just messaged saying they feel alone in this. Well, you're not alone in this community. We join together to solve this huge problem. Let's welcome some of our guests up onto our screens. First of all, a leader from Peak Vision, Priya Morjaria, uh, is uh, with us. She's the head of Global Program Design. Priya, greetings. Hi, Oli. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Great to be reconnected. President Masisi has already praised your organization. Uh, thank you for being here. And next to you, why don't we bring up Dr. or Mr. Quentin Wodon, the lead economist at the World Bank's Education uh, Global Practice. Uh, good evening to you, Quentin. Good evening and or good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. We look forward to your perspective. Uh, next up, Mr. Uh, Werner Obermeyer, uh, known to many of you, I'm sure, the Director of the World Health Organization's Office at the UN Headquarters in New York. Werner, greetings. Afternoon, Oli. Nice to see you again after uh, Dubai. You yeah, look very fit. It's good to reconnect. Thank you, uh, Verna. And uh, our final uh, guest is Ms. Solome Aceres, who is the Specialist School Health uh, and Nutrition uh, Lead at Save the Children. Welcome, Solome. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for allowing me to join. Now, we, uh, we're, we're racing against the clock. So let me ask you a quick opening question, each of you. If we only had two minutes for this panel discussion, if you could only say one thing today about this huge subject, what would it be? Just, just top of your head, the pithiest answer, because I want to draw everybody in immediately. Priya. Well, I think it's important that we present ourselves as a unison, a voice that has evidence and is backed by, you know, experiences from the field as we just heard. First class, absolutely agreed. Solomé, what would be the one thing? Just get our thoughts going. It'd probably be the same as Priya. Partnerships. Partnerships are incredibly critical. Uh, across the entire spectrum. We right. have to include everybody. Across nations, across sectors, here, here. Uh, Verna, what would it be? Top line thought. Well, I would say that schools are obviously a vital resource for influencing the health and well being of students and indeed also their families and the wider community. So we need to focus more on health promoting initiatives at schools and other whole school approaches. These have existed for many, many decades, and I think that we see the interface between health and education as one of the basic tenets for improving health for everyone, but particularly eye health too. Absolutely. Learn from the past, look to the future. Quentin, your top line thought to get us firing on all cylinders. Well, implementing school eye health programs would make a difference. Yeah. It's actually feasible. It's not rocket science, yeah. and it's affordable. It has high, high cost and high low cost and high benefits. Okay. Well, thank you, one and all, for those initial thoughts. Um, buckle in, everyone, because we're going to move quickly through these questions. Priya, help us set the scene. What's the problem? Put it as bluntly as you like. Why do so many children lack the access to the eye care they need? 
Um, there's several factors, but Oli, to be honest, like everyone has said, school eye health programs have been running for decades. We need to change the way we approach them. We approach them in silos. We approach them without the evidence base. So now we need to speak to each other and speak a language that everyone's going to understand. Well, indeed. So, um, Quentin, a language that many people understand is the language of money. But on a serious note, what are the socioeconomic benefits and impacts of child vision impairment? I suppose when it's not there, but also when we get it right, what's at stake? Well, maybe a fact uh, before answering the question. Um, the, the World Bank did work on what we called the changing wealth of nations. Yeah. Um, and the wealth of nations uh, is typically composed of uh, produced wealth like roads or buildings and factories, and natural wealth like oil uh, or minerals, and then human capital wealth, uh, which is uh, the future earnings of the labor force. And human capital wealth is by far the largest components of the wealth of nations. And it is because of that, uh, that uh, school eye health programs and other programs to help children with disabilities by improving the education and, and the human capital of children who become adults later on can have a very large positive effects, um, not only to reduce poverty, but also to promote growth. Yeah, absolutely. So we've already heard, Verna, that school eye health programs have been around for many years. Many have been implemented. So what we want to understand from you, you have a sort of um, ability to see across nations. What are the biggest challenges of integrating eye health into school-based promoting initiatives? You know, I think that we have an advantage now as we recover from COVID. Uh, there has been a lot written and the evidence shows very clearly how the pandemic has affected uh, school children. Uh, with interrupted services, particularly for those uh, children um, that need services most, the special needs uh, children, that we have had an interruption in, uh, in learning, uh, in school meal provision. So when we, when we redesign the improvements that we want to see post pandemic, there are learnings that we can draw on. The learnings from the work of my organization, the World Health Organization, we have partnered with uh, UNESCO. Uh, just this year, we, we launched a, a global package to improve uh, resources for schools, the health and well being of all students of 1.9 billion school aged children and adolescents. These standards are aimed not only at, at national level, but also at sub national and local levels. Uh, and uh, it focuses on developing, planning, funding, and monitoring of whole school approaches. That is one area, really. And I think the work that we have done with the International Telecommunications Union on addressing myopia, uh, Monwar mentions the tremendous burden that we will see over the next couple of decades, literally hundreds of millions uh, of children that will be suffering from myopia. Yeah. Um, we can slow the progression of myopia, we can improve awareness and health literacy, and, and this is simple things that we can do, like regular eye exams and spectacle compliance among children. So yeah. these are things that I, I feel we can, we can harness quickly by, by, by leveraging the, uh, the, the coordination between education and health ministries and civil society, really. It should be yeah. at the cutting end of, of advocacy. Yeah, so, so here's a question on that, because everyone understands why we should be interested in the eye health of our children. But Solomay, tell us why are schools such an effective setting for some of these interventions? What have you noticed? Well, yeah, schools, you know, as, as it's been mentioned, are cost-effective platforms. Um, not only are they cost-effective, but they create equitable and inclusive education pathways for children not only children, um, because through children, we're able to reach their families and the wider community, which for example, with health services, enables us to reach populations that otherwise may not be reached by the traditional health sector. Um, as Ambassador uh, Webson mentioned earlier, you know, with roughly 80% of what a child learns coming through the visual pathway, vision is incredibly critical for education. Yeah. A hundred percent. And 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 tell me a bit more in practice, though, Salome, about the challenges that you see. What, what, what gets in the way? Is it a lack of will, resource? Help me, help me understand. 
I mean, it's a number of different factors. Um, uh, one of the most critical pieces I think is quite common um, because um, as it's been noticed that um, screening is relatively easy to embed within different layers of different programs and integrating it in, but getting the spectacles, getting the provisions of these eyeglasses, which are super cost effective and if given in a timely fashion can really prevent um, worsening or even rever irreversible, you know, eye diseases and, and impact on children, um, it's, it's a part, that's a quite a challenge. And so um, working with the market, with the private sector, with government, um, increasing demand, increasing access, using technology, right? Being innovative, understanding, using different models that are um, truly context specific. You know, we have a lot of great different models, you know, a lot of different models across um, different countries that we use, but it's not a one size fits all for sure. Right. Well, we'd like to hear a bit more about uh, an example of your work uh, a bit later in the discussion, uh, Salome. Um, well, why don't we go back to this sort of um, the, the financing of all of this? Quentin, let me put it bluntly. Are school uh, eye health programmes a cost efficient approach? And I mean, I just wonder how sustainable and replicable they are, especially across low and middle income countries. Right. Well, um, they are not very costly. Um, I mean, there are a few studies in the literature suggesting that uh, the cost per child uh, is a few dollars. So we did work uh, with the Eye Alliance, for example, um, on Liberia, um, and the cost was even lower, uh, just two or three dollars per child um, uh, for uh, the, the child population overall. Um, there are huge benefits uh, for learning. Uh, we found that um, if you can actually see in the classroom, uh, you will learn better. Um, what's also important to note is that uh, while we have made a lot of progress uh, in education and to some extent uh, for children with disabilities to go to school, um, the gaps between children with and without disabilities have uh, remained uh, almost the same uh, for the last 40 years. Um, so we have an opportunity to do this. Uh, again, from a budget point of view, from a Ministry of Education, it is not very expensive. That's not the only thing we need to do. We need to do other things uh, for children with other disabilities. Um, but, but this is one of the areas where uh, the costs are fairly low and, and the benefits are very high. Yeah, so, so I'm going to come back to why these commitments haven't happened over the years to Verna momentarily. But Priya, very briefly, um, if our viewer needed any more encouragement about why schools are such a good place for these interventions, anything you'd add to what Sol uh, Solomay was saying earlier? Yeah, I mean, like Solomay said, it gives you access to children in one place at one time. Um, I think we forget the fact that children spend so much time at school and so much work has already been done on getting children to school. Yeah. And, and so and, that- And on. presumably there, there must be misconceptions that then get in the way of adoption. Anyone that you would call out? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's so much stigma related to glasses wear yeah. and, and then that specifically aimed so much at women and girl children and I personally have been you know experienced this so there's so many other things to address and that's why it's really important that we're speaking to everyone who's involved. Yeah. And that was hinted at in that brilliant film from CBM. So Verna, um, th this concept, and you've underlined this already, you know, it's, it, it goes back, you know, sort of to the 1990s, you know, in terms of health promoting schools, that was articulated in 1992, uh, but only really a few countries have implemented this at scale. So how can we move past commitment? That's the question. Yes. We, we have uh, data from around 90 countries that have implemented some of the standards which have existed, uh, which obviously are far too less. I want to just touch on something that Priya has said, you know, 90% of children uh, in the world are in primary school, 80% are in lower secondary school. So you're looking at uh, children in OECD countries spending about 8,000 hours in the classroom yeah. over an 8 to 10 year period. So the the cost benefit scenario here is, uh, is, is, is very evident. Um, a lot of the work I think that we talk about in terms of low hanging fruit revolves around health promotion. Almost 25% of your disease burden globally can be prevented by focusing on health pro promotion. Yeah. Uh, it's just to address the, the educational and health interface before people become, become ill. And the same with vision. Um, 
I think that the, a good a good example of how we will see uh, progress and scale up action is uh, now that WHO has included preschool and school age vision screening and provision of uh, spectacles in our package essential package of eye care services also endorsed by the World Health Assembly you will see that more and more health ministries and education ministries will will take action uh, and start testing for refractive errors and and, and provision of, of spectacles yeah. and other eye care services in schools. Yes. And these can be done at very low cost. Yeah, and, and just just very briefly, Priya, I'm turning to you because you're almost sort of known, you're such a sort of a, a leader in this space. Um, do we know much about how kids' eye health has been affected over the last two years? I mean, there is definitely evidence of the progression of myopia. There's definitely evidence that it's increasing, and we've known that. But because of what's happened over the past two years, children are spending a lot more time indoors, a lot more time on screens, yeah. less time outdoors. We know those are risk factors for myopia progression. Um, right. And we don't need to do any more research on it. We know it's a big problem, and it's right. going to continue to get worse. Got it. So, so this sort of can sort of sharpen our minds. Um, Solomay obvious about the levers that governments can pull but what about non-state actors what about non-governmental stakeholders what can they do to drive policy change and crucially action yeah oh, oops, sorry can you see me yep. my computer just <laughs> went black for a second okay so um i would say you know again partnerships right when you're looking at the non-governmental group you're looking at awareness raising and advocacy Children, for example, with David's children, children are bread and butter, right? They're our target audience, and they're great agents for change at the home as well as in the community. You know, by spreading these, uh, the importance of these services and the, the consequences of not accessing them, it helps to generate market demand and helps put pressure on the local government to, um, to address these unmet needs. For example, subsidizing access to eyeglasses for poorer households. It can be an, you know, an important advocacy uh, point that they can join in. Um, as I mentioned earlier, oftentimes when we get down to bottlenecks within programs, it can be just that market demand, right? It can also um, just ensuring that the child is assessed is not sufficient enough. We don't get the glasses, and not only if we don't get the glasses, if we don't get the glasses in the right time because children's visual acuity changes more rapidly, um, it, you know, the glasses could be moot in, in a second, right? And so another area is, um, is really looking to seek out the expertise within the country. Um, to develop and to gather and generate that supporting evidence. You know, data is huge. Data is needed for policy reform. Academic institutions, specialized NGOs within the country, civil organizations can all work together to kind of um, help governments see their um, blind spots, you know, and find out what it looks like on the ground, how their policies translate. Yes. And then that lesson works for the government, but also for the global community for good practices. Yes, it does. Who has some advice for one of our audience members based out of South Africa? They initiated the One School at a Time vision screening program. And I think uh, their question is around funding. The impact of our program, they say, is incredible. It's very difficult for us to secure funding locally to accelerate our project. How can we solicit funding abroad? Any tips by show of hand? I'll bring you straight in because we're going to get through a couple of these. Quentin, very quickly. Well, I just want to mention that um, I think there is much more awareness today uh, that uh, school eye health and more broadly, I mean, enabling children with disabilities to go to school and learn in school is a priority. And uh, although for the World Bank, we work mostly with governments, um, there was a decision made that um, as of uh, two years from now, every project, um, sorry, every project at the World Bank uh, will be disability inclusive uh, with uh, specific um, aspects uh, to deal with that. So I, I think there has been quite a bit of change, uh, whether it's the World Bank, whether it's GPE, whether it's WHO, and, and there will be movement. And, and we start from a very low base. If you look at uh, Francophone Africa countries, we have data for 10 countries, and uh, typically only three or four percent of the children today in those countries do benefit uh, from uh, school eye health programs. So there's yeah. a a huge space to go to go up. No, that, that is very clear. Anyone else have just a very practical tip for our guest tuning in on uh, securing funding abroad? Would anyone else like to come in on that? Maybe just not to, to look at the funding as such, but I think a lot of uh, what you could, rec could, could achieve with increased funding, you can also uh, achieve with uh, leveraging partnerships better. Um, you know, where 
our people in country are normally based in health ministries, which notoriously are underfunded. Yes. So the way well, that we I'm get gonna... our work done is uh, to leverage partnerships with civil society. Yeah. I mean, it's not only that children will have better learning outcomes, but if you enable them to see, they can get to school safely, they can get home yeah. safely, they can lead better lives after school. So all the various uh, stakeholders that you can bring in there and also uh, provision of uh, of trained eye care professionals that civil yes. society can can place in schools and with the education ministries, you know, no, thank glasses you, are not expensive. Yeah, you get glasses for a, for a dollar yeah. a pair these days. Yeah, th thank you, Vanna, loud and clear. Solomay, bring this to life with uh, for us with a real example of a partnership you know has helped you thrive. Well, in Ethiopia, um, just really quick to add to, to Vernon's point, I would say indicators are really important when you're working in partnerships, even within government. If the, all the ministries have an indicator, a metric that they are uh, bound to, it helps in really holding accountability. Um, but just to go back to the example, we have a, a really great project in Ethiopia um, that we're partnering with Vision Aid Overseas, which is a specialized NGO um, in vision services, and it's called Vision for Inclusion. I mean, it's a really great project because we're piloting a comprehensive model with the government that looks at the continuum of care of eye health um, uh, to be in included in their school health and nutrition programming. But what we're doing is we're integrating it into existing school health uh, services within the community, linking it to health uh, sector, um, to the health sector to generate that evidence and recommendation. A yes. particular um, really great part of it though, um, is again, when we're looking at partnerships, it's not just at the high level, it's within, right? within the, the full ecosystem that surround a child. So we're looking, we work with teachers, the students, with community members, with health workers. And what we found was, was just a pretty simple model of using mobile eye clinics. And it doesn't just only serve the schools, but also out of school children that are usually not reached and, and the staff and students at those schools. And, and say the children in particular, an innovation that we have created with and through our school health uh, work is technology. We have yes. this uh, project called, or this, uh, this, this work called the Waliki Team, um, and they provide digital tools for learner education and well-being that can be used in a myriad of different ways. But what it's helping to do is in real time um, uh, develop and, and uh, generate all that evidence and, and spread it across the different groups that help to work it. So yes. it's from the teachers to the mobile clinics to the health centers, everyone is connected. Yeah. And what's really great is that that data then can be used um, to identify policy reform, right? Modernizing the uh, school health intervention and vision, um, helping the Ministry of Education really allocate necessary resources for that. Um, and it's across, the, the, the levels of partnerships are, are just so vast. Yeah, th th hugely helpful. I wish we had longer to unpack these. We're gonna go just, uh, just five minutes over our allocated time with the permission of the team here. Priya, help focus our minds because setting this conversation today in context, um, the UN is holding this sort of transforming education summit later this year. How, what can we do to deliver change as part of that summit? What must we do to turn these words into deeds? Um, Ali, I think it's really, really important that where there are programs happening, they're gathering evidence, they're gathering evidence in a standardized way that will speak to the problem. We know there's a problem, and I think it's time we stop speaking to each other and we speak to others about it. Often we're preaching to the choir. Right. And so it's important we are gathering this evidence in a standardized way and showing it to the world. Right. So on that, and we talk about sort of really raising the bar, talking to the world. Quentin, here's a question for you. Um, what do eye health programs need to include to ensure they meet the standards that the UN has talked about to develop these transformative approaches? You know, the UN has stated that to accelerate progress towards SDG 4, we must develop transformative approaches to education that are scalable, reliable, and sustainable. Um, so, so, so what do we have to do to meet the standards? Well, I mean, I think that we have to scale up and that's obvious since so few children uh, in low-income countries have access to school and health programs. Uh, the programs exist. Uh, there are different models, but, but we know they're effective. 
Um, uh, as to your previous question, you asked what can we do? I, I think that um, we still actually don't have a very clear uh, benefit cost analysis uh, for some of those programs. Uh, this is something we are considering doing. Um, it is true for school health programs. It is true for some other types of disabilities. Uh, the, the benefits of, of, of implementing uh, these techniques that are actually well known and, and, and affordable uh, can be very large. So I would put an emphasis on uh, how do we make it, do we make the economic case apart from the moral case of uh, going forward? Because, um, Werner, that's a pretty big problem that Quentin raises there, saying, in his words, we lack the cost-benefit analysis. To what extent do you agree with that, and what would be your remedy if you do? You know, I agree with uh, Quentin that uh, we perhaps do not have all the data that we need, but this is not a problem that we need to wait for all the data to come rolling in. Uh, I think we can get going and I would actually like to see more children's voices. I would like to see young people come and speak at the education summit. I would like to see people come and say, learn from what we have done uh, and, then, and then replicate. Yeah, well, why don't we use our final 20 seconds each to take up Priya's call for others to join us at the table, other stakeholders. So we stop preaching to each other. Who should that be? Solomé, Quentin, Werner, then Priya. Very briefly, Solomé. Off, uh, yep. Sorry, is that again? I saw my audio Please. cut out. Who must, we who must we invite to the table? What groups are not part of the conversation that must be to solve this? Oh, children, sorry. Yes, absolutely, children. Fantastic. That, that'd be my... Quentin, then Werner. Maybe teachers. Um, I mean, they have the experience on the ground of helping the children uh, and they can help of uh, figuring out what works. Yeah. First class, Werner. Well, you know, I said children, so I'm not going to walk back. No, stick to your guns, 100%. Let's hear their voices, understand what they really think. Priya. Parents. They're the ones who make the decision and they will always want the best for their child. Yeah, two thumbs up from Solomé, and I know that will resonate. And I'm sorry we don't have longer, but we will next time uh, we meet. Let me say to Solomé, to Priya, to Quentin uh, and to Werner, thank you so much. We give you a sort of collective uh, Zoom webinar round of applause. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my final thank you um, goes in two parts. Firstly, uh, to our hosts at the UN Friends of Vision uh, and, of course, the co-chairs and all of the speakers and to the Friends of Vision Secretariat, crucially uh, to the team at IAPB, the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness, who have put so much work into today. My final thank you goes to you uh, for tuning in uh, from all around the world. If you know someone that should see today's broadcast and experience what we have been sharing, please do pass the message on. Uh, it's been a great honour. I wish we had longer, but for now, this is Oli Barrett saying thank you very much for tuning in. And until next time we meet, goodbye.